Well, good morning, Midway Church. That was a weak good morning, my goodness. I'll tell you what. Good morning, Midway Church. There you go. You're not going to get back more than you put in. You know that by now. You got to give it your best, all right? I hope my sermon excels beyond what that first good morning was. Amen. Glad y'all are here. I'm glad you're in the room. Glad you folks are watching online. And uh, this is uh, good. Well, last Sunday was amazing, honestly. I want to just recap a couple of things. And if you'll let me ramble for just a second. We're going to be in 2 Thessalonians uh, in just a minute, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. But last Sunday, as we celebrated our 175th anniversary, what a, what a joyous time to celebrate together uh, what God has done over the years and have you as a part of that. And hope you've been able to see some of the photos. Hope you've been able to get one of the booklets, have for a keepsake. Uh, it tells our story. God's been at work for a long time. You and I are now part of that story story, and he's going to continue to be at work uh, because he isn't done yet. And I love uh, what we're studying right now. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this week, as we have gone into 21 days of prayer and fasting, I trust that you've been challenged and blessed if you walked along that journey with us as you've received that information. Uh, Pastor Kevin wrote all of that for us and has challenged us to lay a good foundation for the years to come. And as I have read through and prayed and studied and gone along that journey and process this week, it's been a, a great challenge and encouragement for my own life just to reflect and also to lay a foundation for the future. So if you haven't started in that process, I hope you'll do so. So, and since the month of, uh, I think it was April, uh, we've been in the process of studying second, uh, first and second Thessalonians. Now, uh, that's where we are today, where we have two more Sundays in the books of Thessalonians. Uh, this is one of the best churches. This is the best church mentioned in Scripture. This is the kind of church that I dream of Midway Church being. As you read Scripture and you see Corinthians, Philippians, Thessalonians, Colossians, Galatians. Thessalonians is that church at the top that the Apostle Paul speaks so well of over and over and over again. He has such good words and kind words about them. Now, the interesting thing is he is in Corinth while he's writing those words, and he sends it as a letter. Corinth was the worst church that he described entire, in the entire New Testament. They had one problem after another problem after another problem, and it seemed to never end. As I have studied, and all of our teaching pastors have studied and taught these teachings in Thessalonians, we have done so with a mindset that we love and dream for Midway Church being that kind of church. Um, I, I grew up in church. I love the church. I'm a believer in the impact of the church. I've seen church life at its best, and it leaves such a massive legacy that we cannot describe. Every person in this room who knows Jesus has been so greatly impacted by a church somewhere. And it, it, it is a little frustrating today, to be honest, to see so many people who seem to think they can have a good Christian life without church and without the church. They'll say, I love Jesus, but I don't care anything about church. And there, there's a, an anti-movement regarding church life. <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's very, very prominent. You'll see it. If you're, if you're a Twitter person or Facebook person, you'll see some of those comments out there. Well, I don't go to church, but I love Jesus or, or, or whatever. And I just want to say to you, you'll never be all that God has for you without being connected to a church somewhere. And I, I love the church. And so as we study this, I hope that you will uh, dig in deep and continue to uh, make yourself available to be all that God wants you to be and be committed to church life. I've also seen the worst of church life. I, I grew up, my granddad was a pastor. My father was a deacon. I had uh, grandparents who taught Sunday school. My mom taught Sunday school. And I've never known what life was like without going to church every Sunday, every Sunday of my life from the time I was born. Every Sunday, and I mean that, every Sunday of my life. There's never been a season of life where I missed uh, three or four Sundays in a row in my whole life of 58 years. And it's just been a top priority because I was raised that way. And some of that, I didn't want to be there. But my dad said, you're going. <clears throat> and when you feed yourself, pay your own bills, then you can decide what to do on Sunday. But until then, you, we go to church. I, I, I want to say to you, I'm grateful for that. 
I'm grateful for that. You eat my food and you turn on my light switches, we go to church on Sunday. And that's what we've done. And so I, I'm thankful, but I remember seeing a man, I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this to lay out the foundation of this, this message today. Uh, I remember seeing someone, I was in my teens, and I saw two men in our church who had loved each other, served side by side in church life, part of our church for a long time, get angry over stuff that was happening in the church. And I saw one of them look at another on the front porch of the church and he cursed and drew back his fist that I'll knock you off this porch. And I, when I say I've seen the worst of church life, I've seen the worst of church life. And I've seen people I love and have confidence in no longer live virtually seemingly as Christians. Now, I'm gonna lay out something here today and say that this is foundational for everything that we need to be, and it's about truth. Without truth, there is no church life worth anything. Absolute truth. So today's message title is Believing, Living, and Sharing Truth. Believing, Living, and Sharing Truth. And if I had a tagline for this, it would be, in a world that doesn't believe there's a such thing as truth, okay? In our country, there was a time when we could say our nation was a Christian nation, we had Christian foundations, a lot of those things, and we may as well stop whining about it. That is no longer, it's over, that's done. We have to ask ourselves as believers, how are we gonna live out truth in a world that's hostile to it? How do we respond to those who are hostile to foundational truths that we've built our life on. So if you're ready for the word, 2 Thessalonians chapter three, you're ready for it, say I am. Here we are, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter three and verse one. Believing, living, and sharing truth. Finally, pray for us, brothers, that the Lord's message may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. And that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do what you are, what we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. Now I want to highlight the first intro into this text. He says, finally, pray for us, brothers, that the Lord's message may spread rapidly. He's talking about truth. He's talking about God's word, God's truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's truth. May it spread rapidly. Now that links, we know that's the context because it's a continuation of a statement that begins in chapter two and verse 13 when he says this. Chapter two, verse 13. But we must always thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. When they believe the truth, it transformed them. And he's able to reflect back over the previous several months when they heard the truth, believed the truth, began to live the truth, and now are sharing the truth in less than a two-year period of time. I think that's good. They believe the truth, are living the truth to a point that he's openly astonished and saying, I'm proud of you and astonished by how well you've embraced the truth and living the truth. And I don't even have to come and ask you, but every town I go to, I hear about the word of God being shared from you to them. We get there and you're already sharing the truth with them. You have friends, relatives, and neighbors that are taking the word from you and the word of God is being powerful in your life. So they are evidence of believing, living, and sharing the truth. Now, the apostle Paul here speaks virtually as a pastor at this point in need. For the first time, we see him speaking as a pastor, asking them for something. Usually when I get a text or when I get a letter or an email or when I get a phone call, someone is asking something from me. That's the role I'm in. I'm a pastor. I'm the pastor. So when people contact me, they have a need or they need a prayer or they need a visit or they need somebody that needs help or they need wisdom about something and they're asking something of me. And I just want you to know every now and then pastors actually need something too. And the Apostle Paul writes here in this text he says, finally, pray for us. He's talking about himself and Silas 
and Timothy. He says, pray for us, brothers, that the Lord's message may be spread rapidly and may be honored. And so he's saying, as we're over here in Corinth and we're no longer with you, pray for us while we're carrying on the work that God has called us to do. Now, I want to say that even as co-pastor, having Pastor Kevin here has been a great blessing already just starting over the last few weeks because for the first time in my life since I was 19 years old, I have a pastor now. And it feels good to have a pastor. For the first time, I have a pastor. I have someone who can pray for me or I can talk to about things and see as my pastor. And he and I have talked about sharing that role together over these next few years together. But he says, pray for us, pray for us. There's really three things that he highlights here regarding truth that are on his mind regarding truth. The first one we see is an opportunity for it. Opportunity for truth. We have opportunities for truth from time to time, but do we seize them? He says, pray for us, brothers, that the Lord's message may spread rapidly. I'm convinced that he has in mind a verse that's in Psalm chapter 147 and verse 15, where it says this, God, he sends his command throughout the earth and his word runs swiftly. I like that. His word runs swiftly. Now, every place the apostle Paul went, the word didn't run swiftly. As a matter of fact, he hit hard walls in some cities he went to and preached the word. And it would say that if you read the book of Acts, he went there and preached and no one believed. No one believed. There are times when he hit a, a, a hard wall and no one believed. But then he'll go to some places and it's like they readily embrace the word. They embrace the truth. And they received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we know the Thessalonians were a people like that because he says, you pray, brothers, that the Lord's message may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Now, I want to take you back for just a second to a time when they began to respond to the gospel. You, you will find that first it was a few Jewish people who responded to the gospel. Then there were some Gentiles who responded to the gospel. And then there were masses who responded to the gospel. And the apostle Paul was only there for three weeks. Jesus gave a parable of what we call the parable of the soils. Our life, it's where our life is compared. The way we respond to the word of God being put before us, he compares our heart to soil. Is it fertile soil? Is it hardened soil? Is it rocky soil? What kind of soil do you have? I have a garden, but it's a new place. We're, we haven't gotten the soil just right yet. It's my second year in that spot. I had some soil brought in because it was already down to the clay. And I want you to know that I have four. I have two massive, beautiful rows of green beans. I have two beautiful rows of, of peas. And the vines are about that tall. And there's not a single bean or a single pea on a single vine. They're gorgeous. It reminds me of a lot of people who go to church every Sunday. <laughs> huh? We, we, we dress up. Our soil hadn't gotten just right. We're not responding the way we ought to respond to the word of God. And so therefore, we look good on the outside, but we're not putting forth fruit on the inside. There's no no fruit going forth in our life. And the Apostle Paul is reminded of a time for these individuals, their, their heart was obviously ready for the Word of God because when they heard the Word of God, they received the Word of God and embraced the Word of God. They not only heard it with their ears, they heard it with their heart and they embraced it and their lives began to change and they started living out the Word of God in their life. And Paul said, pray for that. I want to see that happen again. He remember when it happened in their life, and now it's happening again. Um, opportunity. In our day, we, there are plenty of opportunities. In our church, as a matter of fact, we have lots of mission partners, lots of mission partners. Through our denominational partners, through community partners, we partner with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I was excited just recently. They're in virtually all the schools in, in the West Georgia region, led by uh, just amazing, amazing staff and, and team. And um, I had lunch with uh, some of them just recently and gave them some money that you guys had donated. We not only paid them on a regular basis each month or each quarter of how it's sent out, but we had some money for Bibles. 
And I asked Jay Webb, who coordinates, I said, Jay, can you use money for Bibles? Yeah, absolutely. And so we were able to no- donate, uh, I think, $10,000 for Bibles for high school students throughout West Georgia, right here from Midway Church. $10,000. I think that's awesome. Uh, we have a mission partner in India named Benjamin. He said, Benjamin, can you, can you use some money for some Bibles in India? Oh, man, can we use money for Bibles? We, we have this amount of money, and I think we donated maybe $5,000 to, to Benjamin for some money just for Bibles. You donated about twenty dollars or $25,000 just for Bibles. We, we just bought some uh, addiction Bibles for people with addictions that have special notes to help people walk through addiction issues. And we're looking for ways to add value to people in ways that meet them where they are in their own challenges and their own issues because we know the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And if we can get the Word of God in people's hearts and if they're soiled, their heart is ready for the Word, it transforms them from the inside out. Uh, I, have to, I have a confession to make. I, I'm not proud of this, but I stood right here back in the spring of this year, probably around February or or March, early spring, late winter. And I I share with you how I had gotten done. I was done. I was finished with a relative, my brother specifically, specifically. Been a long, long, hard journey. And it just never, never, after years and years and years, never got better. It's like I, I'm just done. And I, I, I told God, I'm done. You ever done that? <laughs> and he and I have talked about this. Uh, and God said to me in my personal time with him, uh, you're not done until I say you're done. <laughs> you, you, you ever heard that? You're not done till I say you're done. Uh, I'm not done with you yet. Sorry as you've been. That's what he reminded me of. Y'all okay? I, I, I've loved that song since I was a kid. He's still working on me <laughs> to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and stars, sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because after 58 years, he's still working on me. Huh? <laughs> whole earth in, five, in six days, still working on me. <laughs> and I said, I'm done. He said, no, you're not done. Within a few days, I picked up my brother in the mercy room, unconscious, broken arm. And uh, I was reminded of why I'm not done. I want to fast forward a few months. I used to be so frustrated for my phone to ring and see his name. It was all confession. Because I knew, number one, it meant trouble. Number two, it meant he needed something. It's the only time I got calls. Four months now, he just got his... uh, Four months, he's just got his four-month pen, a, a coin for being clean for four months. <clears throat> he spent all day yesterday, yesterday morning, with a group uh, in one of the most crime-infested areas of West Atlanta, going door-to-door, de- door-to-door delivering bags of food and and gospel tracts door to door. Uh, living in a culture that's not a culture he grew up in. Grew up out on the farm. He's living in a city. He's living around crime daily. And he says, I've never felt more at home. I've never felt more safe. Spent many years in prison. He said, I'm making less money than I've ever made. I own less than I've ever owned. He doesn't have an automobile. He doesn't have furniture. He has clothes, a few basics. He's living in a hotel type room with a convenient, little convenience kitchen. 
Phone rang. By the way, he said, I have less than I've ever had, make, more, make less than I've ever made, and I'm happier than I've ever been. It's a phrase he said. Uh, he said, I, I've been clean these four months longer than any time period since I was 15 years old without any kind of substance. Uh, you say, I thought he was in prison. Yeah, it's, there's more in there than there is out here, by the way. <laughs> we thought he'd come out clean. He, he couldn't. He didn't. He called two weeks ago, the place he's working. He called and he said, uh, man, I had this idea. He said, you, you can pray for me. He said, I, I'm working with all these people. And a lot of them are uh, Latinos. I've begun to talk to some of them. Some don't speak English, but he said, I've been asking if they have a Bible. They don't have a Bible. He said, I've tried to share some of my story. But he said, I asked my boss, who's actually the plant manager over the, over the company. He said, Could I, if, if I get Bibles, if I buy Bibles. Can I give everybody in the company a Bible? That's my brother that I wouldn't have given you five, I wouldn't have bet $5 he'd be alive within a year, six months ago. He had those Bibles come in this past week. And tomorrow morning, the plant manager's bringing all employees together. And he said, you can hand everybody a Bible as long as you'll share with them your story. And if you'll share with them how they can know Jesus. I'm talking about opportunity for truth. Looking for opportunity to share truth. I'm convinced we have a lot more opportunity than, than most of us take advantage of. So tomorrow morning, if you have something you want to pray for tomorrow morning, you can pray for bread. He calls about five times a day now. <laughs> and I'm actually glad to see his name pop up. You know why? <clears throat> he didn't call asking for a thing. He's found contentment in Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> he calls to tell me about some opportunity God's given him or somebody he's been able to share his story with or his faith with or something God's done or it just, it's, and it's constant. I, and I'd, I'd ask him, I said, Brad, we were on the phone yesterday for 45 minutes. I said, you went 25 or 30 years. How so much change? Good, wholesome change. You're the brother I knew. At 12 and 13 and 14 years old. How? I got a lot of people who need to know how. He said, well, I have to be on the bus to go to work at 6 in the morning. So I get home at 5.30. He said, so I get up at 4. He said, the first thing I do Verbatim. First thing I do is thank God he let me live another day. He said, I open up my Bible. And he said, I read my Bible. And he said, when I get finished praying and reading my Bible, he said, then I go to the bathroom. <laughs> and he said, then I cook my breakfast and make my lunch. And then I go to work. And he said, I, got, I, I can wear one, one earpiece while I'm working. And he said, they told me I can listen to music in that earpiece. And he said, I listen to Christian music all day long or I'm listening to preaching all day long. And he said, it's just changing me. It's just changing me. And he's quoting Bible verses to me. And that's in four months. Now, I, I'm, I was done. I'm done. 
I was over. I, I was finished. But God, God wasn't done. And he isn't flawless. He isn't perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not flawless. You're not perfect. You're not flawless. What I'm saying to you is this. There's an essence of truth that can transform you. Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth will do what? And we don't ever pick up the truth. <laughs> we don't focus on the truth. We don't devour the truth. We don't take the, the truth and put it into our life. We, we focus more on the other stuff about success in life rather than the truth. And the key to his life right now, he said, I have to do this. This is what I have to do. I have to wake up at four in the morning and I have to spend time in God's word. That's, that's life or death for me. It's freedom or bondage for me. It's addiction or freedom for me. I have to do that. And that's what's transforming me. And I just thought, my goodness, I have to confess as a pastor and I've been a Christian for a long time. I'm a professional Christian if there's ever been one. That's <laughs> what I do. And there's so often in my life I've forgotten what it's like to be broken. And I think it's all right for me to go day after day without spending time in God's word from time to time if I'm not careful. I can find myself right back there. Many of us think we've done good if we can come to church two Sundays in a row, much less get up and spend time in God's word seven days a week. But there's no substitute. My point is, there are opportunities. Seize those opportunities. Pray for those opportunities. And let's pray for one another for those opportunities. I've got to move on because you're not listening fast enough. I got stuck, didn't I? That's all right. Good. Number two, there's opposition to truth. Opposition of it. Always going to be opposition to truth. There are people who don't want the truth. There's people in this world who don't want to know truth, who don't believe there is a such thing as truth. Your truth is all relative to who you are, what you want, what you believe. It's just up to you. And the church has to stand on truth. We're, we're also in a time, there used to be this thing in Christian life called apologetics, where it's really about defending truth. It's about standing up on truth. What does God's word actually teach? And we're living in a time today, a culture, the cancellation culture, where if you actually stand and declare this is what the Bible teaches as absolute truth, you're not being nice. And not being nice in this culture is the worst sin that there can be. Because you're a Christian and you're, you go to church and you're not nice. Why are you not nice? Because you said something was absolutely true, and which means something else is false or something else is wrong. And that's not nice to, think, to call somebody else that was wrong. So how in the world do we deal with truth? Understand there's opposition to truth. Two things here the Apostle Paul addresses regarding his, his uh, opposition, the, the opposition of truth. Their situation, their situation, he's in Corinth. He started off in Thessalonica. He then gets run out of Thessalonica, has to leave by night, goes to Berea. He gets run out of Berea and he goes to Athens. He goes to Athens. They make fun of him and ridicule him because he believes in the resurrection and he has to leave Athens. He ends up in Corinth and he's there for a year and a half. It's during that year and a half that he writes both these letters to the church and the believers at Thessalonica. And it's a small reprieve. Because if you continue to read in Acts chapter 16, 17, and 18, you'll find persecution finds him in Corinth also. <laughs> there was just always some, some opposition to truth. So don't allow the opposition to get you sidetracked. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not only does he talk about the situation, but their security. His ultimate answer is in verse 3 when he says, But the Lord is faithful. Deliver us, pray that God would deliver us from evil and, and wicked men. But the Lord is faithful. He always has been faithful and always will. Um, the last words of the Apostle Paul are in 2 Timothy. That's the last book that he wrote before he had his head cut off. Now, he don't know his head's gonna get cut off at this point. But he knows trial's coming. He's in chains. He don't know what the verdict's gonna be. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 16. 2 Timothy 4, verse 16, here it is. At my first defense, no one came to my assistance, but everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me. <laughs> I like that. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the proclamation might be fully made through me. The proclamation, that's, that's the truth. That the truth might be fully made through me. And all the Gentiles might hear, so... I was rescued from the lion's mouth. 
The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I love how he says, the Lord will rescue me and bring me to his heavenly kingdom. <laughs> A lot of people feel like, well, Paul, I bet when he got, got his head cut off, some people probably thought, well, the Lord didn't rescue him. No, he already knows here. The Lord's gonna rescue me and take me to his heavenly kingdom. I think sometimes the greatest rescue we could possibly have for, would be for God to take us out of here. Do y'all remember Calgon many years ago? <laughs> remember that commercial? Calgon, take me away. And sometimes that's a prayer of mine. Opposition of it. Opportunity for it. Number three, obedience to it. We're talking about truth. He talked to them about obedience to the truth. In verse four, he says, we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do what we command. Now, sometimes we struggle with words that strong, what we command. But understand, they had no Bible. They had no Bible. They had the prophets. They had the apostles who were speaking God's truth into their life. The Bible is in the process of being written. You and I have the Bible, but they're having to hear the commands of the apostles and of the prophets and make a decision. Am I going to obey that or am I not? Now, I said earlier, there's no substitute for obeying God's word. It's, it's actually a major component, component of the Great Commission. It's not just going to all the world and make disciples, but Matthew 28 and verse 20 follows up with this teaching them to observe or to obey everything I have commanded you. So obedience is a part of the Great Commission. James 1 verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And when Jesus prayed for all of us in John 17, 17, he said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. How can a meth addict, one of the most addictive drugs in the world, get clean? I know it's only been four months. I know, I know. I know it's one day at a time. One part I didn't tell you is he chain smoked in the middle of that. And on his own, by his own decision, Four weeks ago, finished his last. He called me and said, I, I, he, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm smoking my last cigarette ever. My last one. And I, and I just thought, another thing that's hard, hard, hard to quit. I said, my, my goodness, boy, how you, how you doing this stuff? I, I need to quit eating bacon. Bacon's one of my big downfalls. I mean, I always thought ice cream and bacon's what's going to hand out when you enter the gates of heaven. <laughs> I, I, I got stuff I have, to, I, I have to watch for my own life. But it's hard when you love something, your body loves something and craves it. How do you, how do, you do that? I get up four in the morning. <laughs> got to get in the Word. You shall know the truth. The truth set you free. Uh, three quick questions. In your own journey, do you, number one, do you know Jesus? He is the living word. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. Do you know, do you know him? He's the living word. Secondly, are, are you in the word daily? This, the Bible. Since I was a little boy, the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. It still is. I, I trust it. I, I believe it. I love it. Amen. My life's built on it. Are you in the word? And finally, are you sharing the word? Are you looking for opportunities to share it with somebody else? Because the only hope this world has is the everlasting, eternal, never-changing Word of God. Everything else is going to change. Everything else. The educational system is going to change. Um, politics all changes. 
so much about culture changes. He says, my word will stand forever. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, but the word of God endures forever. And he says, this is the word whereby the gospel is preached unto you. People of Midway Church, I want us to, I, I pray, God, make us a church like the Thessalon- Thessalonian people. May we embrace and obey the word of God. Let me ask you about your heads when we close your eyes. Some of you are here today. You've never given your heart and life to Jesus. You're not 100% certain if you died, you'd go to heaven. I invite you to a personal relationship with Jesus. Trust him. Call upon him with me. Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I surrender all. I invite you into my life to take over. I ask you to forgive me of everything. And from this day forward, I'm all yours. I thank you for loving me and saving me. Others in the room, you know him. You've given your life to him. But you've forgotten what it's like to be broken and to need and hunger the word of God. Being a Christian has become normalized to you. Would you get up tomorrow morning and begin to devour and take in God's word for your own soul? Use it as a mirror for your own life. Use it as a plate from which to eat your own food for your soul. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.